Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is our service for November 26th, 2023. It is the end of the liturgical year. Next week, we start up with Advent. We talk a lot about being present to the present moment around here, about being present to God's presence in the moment. And we've talked in the past few weeks about being grateful and how gratitude allows us to experience an internalized joy, to be present to God on that mountaintop. But here we are, the week after Thanksgiving, the big celebration is over, vacation time is up, and a daunting few weeks of work pressures loom. Family has gone home, the weather's getting bleak, Black Friday, our pagan holiday of capitalism has left us feeling sullied, we're straggling off the mountain. That peak encounter is somewhere back up there in the mist. The feast is over, and there can be this void, this sense of loss. But this, too, is just a sign that we're forgetting about gratitude already. As we enter the gates back into this season of our lives, we again are invited to do so, like with every gateway to pass through with thanksgiving in our hearts. This week is all about giving thanks always, before, during, and after the feast. Join me in our responsive call to worship. Come, let us give thanks to God. We give thanks for the gift of warm bread, the smell of dinner cooking in the oven, and the joy of gathering around a table together. Come, let us give thanks to God. We give thanks for all the times God has made a way out of no way, providing for us in body and spirit just when we need it. Come, let us give thanks to God. We give thanks for the ways God weaves us together as a community of love and care, supporting one another in the ebbs and flows of daily life. Let us come into God's presence with grateful praise. Come, let us worship God together. Amen. Let's take some time praying for peace around our world. O God, source of life, creator of peace, help your children, anguished and confused, to understand the futility of hatred and violence, and grant them the ability to stretch across political, religious, and national boundaries so they may confront horror and fear by continuing together in the search for justice, peace, and truth. With every fiber of our being, we beg you, O God, to help us not to fail nor falter. Amen. Our first reading from the Gospel is from John 6, verses 1 to 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming, coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to have buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come to the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. 
Let's join together in our prayer of confession. Generous God, whose giving knows neither measure nor end, we confess that all too often we have kept our own hearts, hands, and minds firmly closed. Forgive us for those times when our own wants and wishes have filled the horizon to the exclusion of all else and made us blind and deaf to the needs and concerns of others. Forgive us for those moments when the fear that sharing what we have will lead to our own impoverishment has kept us silent and still when those around us are in need. Forgive us for those situations when seeing only a problem rather than daring to dream a solution has left us fettered and powerless where we might have been building your kingdom. Forgive us, Father. Help us to transcend self-centeredness, greed, and fear, and to always to feel, think, and act as those who know the hope that is rooted in the generous giving of God. And now, let's confess our sins silently where we are. Through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. During our in-person service, this is a time when we share our joys and concerns and pray for one another. For those of you who can only connect with us online, please know that we welcome your prayer requests. We care deeply about your joys and concerns. You may share these with us anytime, and we'll be sure to pray for you in our service. You may submit requests through any of the methods listed on the screen. And also for those joining our service online, please consider offering some of what God has blessed you with to our church here in Magnolia so that we may use it to share God's love into our community. Let's pray for this week's offering. God of abundance, as we bring gifts to your altar, we confess that we have wallowed in scarcity thinking. We worry that we might not have enough, not just in our own lives, but also as part of your church eternal. Our scarcity thinking has sentenced us to think small in what we can do and moved us to believe in the dark corners of our consciousness that you are somehow limited. Forgive us when we have been afraid to believe that you have enough to meet every need the the world had in the past, has now, and will have in the future. As witnesses of Christ's abundant love, we pray. Amen. Now let's join together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our gospel reading from John 6, now with verses 16 to 23. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, The crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. (laughs) Hey, we made it through Thanksgiving. At our house, we hosted a few relatives, our kids, some friends, three people in all. At least there were three total, if I'm counting people the way they counted people in the crowd in today's reading. 
That is, just counting the adult males in attendance. Kind of a small Thanksgiving, actually, just three of us. And yet the three of us, we did eat an entire turkey with stuffings, sides, even a couple pies. And I mean, if you want to be technical about it, I guess there were some women and children there. Okay, so there were 11 of us, but still, I would like to call it the feeding of the three. <laughs> okay, today we read a passage from John, which is all too familiar. Just back in August, we read the same story from Matthew at the start of our series on God with us. Jesus feeding the 5,000, we call it a problematic title, which admits to 5,000 men in the crowd, but who knows how many women and children were there. If anything, this miracle is greatly underestimated, probably more of a feeding of the 11,000 or 12,000 or more. Okay. <laughs> Pedantic. Huge crowd anyway. We struggled to feed our 11 people at Thanksgiving, and here's this feast being resourced for a thousand times as many people. Did you know that this, this feeding of the 5,000, is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels? The only one. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. For some reason, this picnic captured the imagination of all the Gospel writers. What was it about this story that made them all record it? I mean, it's a nice story and all, but providing a spontaneous meal this one time seems kind of insignificant compared to people with lifelong health and physical issues being completely healed, or compared to, I don't know, tearing down of empires or overthrowing the power of death. And it's just bread and fish not even bottomless wine jugs as part of the meal. I don't know. It seems odd that this story is so prominent. Maybe the gospel writers, they just like their picnics. When we lived in Kathmandu, Nepal, back in the late 90s, there was a six-day work week there. And there was a movement underway to petition for a five-day work week. I remember an editorial, though, in the Kathmandu Post, vehemently against the vices which would grow in their country if they succumbed to this slothful lifestyle. Preeminent among the potentials for societal decay was the threat that, I kid you not, quote, a five-day work week could lead to excessive picnicking, end quote. <laughs> okay, so you know, I guess picnics, they can just be a big deal in some cultures. Maybe this picnic thing just, it just really blew their minds. Okay. So, picnic aside, there is so much going on in these verses that it's hard to narrow down where to start. We could talk about John's hidden literary clues in the text. For example, whenever there's a mountain in the scenery, it's a sign that something important is going to happen. Mountains are where divine human conversations take place. And then Jesus sits down. And that signifies that this is a teaching moment. He's got something important to say. And also, John says, the Passover festival was near. Another signal that this is an important moment in Jesus' life and death. Or we could talk about the fact that three of the four gospel writers link the feeding story to the walking on water story. That was today's second reading. There is something important there, too, it seems. Perhaps it is that hunger and fear are two needs that are universal in our human experience, and meeting those needs is important to Jesus. Perhaps it's about the disciples learning to trust Jesus as God's Son for provision, even for their physical necessities. We could even talk about the fact that both stories, the feeding and the walking on the water, end with attempts to control Jesus, failed attempts. A reminder that we serve Jesus, not the other way around. But let's just focus in on the picnic. But then, maybe it's more than just a picnic. It starts off as more like a pop quiz. Jesus tests Philip, asking, where? Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? But like so often happens when it comes to a financial discussion, we often don't hear the actual question asked. Jesus asked, where shall we buy the food? And receives an unrelated reply. It would take more than a half year's wages just to give everyone a bite. 
Buying food is totally not practical, Jesus. I don't even care about your question where. We just can't do it. And then Andrew, he sees a boy with five small loaves and small fish. And by the way, I love the use of the word small on these, just to clarify for anybody that there's no way these five loaves could actually feed 2,000 people each. I kind of think Andrew was being sarcastic, diffusing the awkward moment with a little joke. He sees the boy with the food. He's like, I know. Let's use this boy's teeny tiny loaves and five itty bitty fishies to feed everyone. But Jesus was there and he was ready to provide. Just tell me where and it will be done. The others, though, they lacked the vision. They were caught up in the wrong questions. As usual, they didn't understand. We can so easily get caught up in the how. How can we possibly do this? And we limit our dreams. We look at the world with limited vision. And while Jesus asked where, and then the disciples responded, how? The real question to be asked behind all of it is, who? This is a who story. Maybe even a couple of who's. And the first who was Jesus. Where will we buy the bread, he asked Philip. From you, was the right answer. And in our second connected reading, where he scares the disciples by walking on the water, he says, it is I, don't be afraid. He actually says, I am, I am, you know, it sounds familiar, I am with you, said that burning bush to Moses way back when. The who in this story, like almost all good Sunday school lessons, is Jesus, the one who meets our needs, the worker of miracles. And then there's a second who at the center of this story. It would be us and them, the many, many thousands of hungry people on the side of the mountain. We all, all us humans, we all are hungry for something we can't provide for ourselves. But we are invited to sit down to a picnic. Jesus says, have the people sit down. But the word used for sit down, it really means take a place at the table. Sit down to dinner. In our culture, we might translate, Jesus says, have the people pull a chair up to the table. We are all guests at the Lord's table, at the picnic, at the Thanksgiving meal. All of us, even, and I know this is hard to believe, even the women and children. <laughs> okay. The fact that we are all invited, that's the real miracle here. We are all guests at the table, regardless of who you are, regardless of who they say you are. We are all guests at the table. Then Jesus says to gather up the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. That's a sure sign of the kingdom, of the new community. There's no leftovers. It's true about the food, like having just enough manna for the day, or when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. You know, using what's needed and nothing more. It's about good use of the planet's resources. But it's also true about people. Nothing, no one is thrown aside. Everything, everyone is valued. We are each guests at the Lord's table, not afterthoughts or nuisances. We are welcomed, invited, included, part of the family. But there's something that stands out from this family picnic on the grass. Something that's memorable, at least to John, if to no one else. So we have the meal miracle. And then we have the walking on water miracle later in the same passage in our second reading. And then we have this waiting crowd hoping to catch a glimpse of the miracle worker, hoping to get another chunk of miracle bread and fish. If we keep reading beyond our text for today, we find Jesus actually getting annoyed with them for the bread thing, since he thinks they are missing the point. But John does seem to have gotten the point. And we know that, that by how he describes the event. It's so easy to miss it in the wake of all these flashy, perfect for Sunday school miracle stories. It's there in the final verse of our text. The people were hanging out in the place where all of this had happened. And he calls it the miracle place, right? No. John doesn't call it a miracle place. He doesn't call it the place where the 5,000 were fed. He said that this is the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Really? That's the description? 
Not where an amazing miracle went down, not where the veil between the unknown and known went thin and the unexplainable took place. No, where they ate after the Lord had given thanks. Think about it. That's what John wants us to remember, that this meal, this miracle happened after gratitude was expressed. Gratitude for the abundance that didn't look like abundance. Gratitude for the satisfaction that would come out of the hunger. Gratitude becomes a way of seeing and a way of being in the world. We give thanks to God for what is about to happen. We give thanks for what we might not yet see, but what we trust God will provide. And we give thanks looking back at God's faithfulness. This is the last in our series on gratitude, and next week we dive into the new liturgical year with Advent. But this spiritual discipline, this simple practice of gratitude, it is so fundamental to our faith. Like any discipline, it is one that we choose and then work at it until we become better at it. We live because of that choice, grateful to God, first of all, for the abundance that surrounds us. But, great, but gratitude spills over into the rest of our lives as well. We are grateful for those in our circles of care. We are grateful to those who help us live in the manner to which we have become accustomed. We recognize that none of the benefits we enjoy come without effort on someone's part. And we learn to be grateful to those who help make our society run smoothly. If we were to make a list of all those who provide for us, who care for us, who stand with us, we would probably never get to the end. We are truly woven together in this human tapestry of love and caring. Jesus invites us to become more aware of that reality and to live gratefully every day. And not just with a feel-good, it's not just a feel-good thing to do. It is truly the foundation of who we are in Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. God of healing and transformation, we hunger and thirst for your abundant life. We bring you our sorrow and ask for the bread of joy. We bring you our despair and ask for the bread of hope. We bring you our weariness and ask for the bread of inspiration. Meet us here. We need the bread of heaven to sustain us as we journey to find our way, that we may be one with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the blessing. Go now giving thanks for all that God has done and all that God is doing in your life, in this community and in the world, and for all that God will be doing. May we... May we be surprised by grace as gratitude opens us to recognize God's abundant provision all around us. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you in Advent. Bye, friends.